themes that are very popular and that I'll speak in this time or so. We understand, but we still hope to get more uh, from the members today. Uh, let me start with uh, obviously thanking you all for being here and thanking everybody who helped make, make this um, conference or workshops a success. Everybody who, uh, uh, whether from the community or uh, law enforcement. Um, we're going to, um, our, our goal is to, uh, as much as possible, to, to build uh, bridges and, and, uh, and partnerships between our community and the law enforcement community. And this workshop, or these workshops, um, are as a result of, 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 of the work that we've been doing with uh, our law enforcement here for years, um, but mainly with SPD, uh, with all respect to the federal offices here, but we... We do more work with SPD because we like them more. Uh, we, no, we, 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 we like the local ones. We've been, they are actually the first ones who started working with us after 9-11. Uh, it took the federal government some time to come in, uh, and join. So, uh, but now they're, we're all, they're on board and we appreciate this. Uh, so like I said, our goal is to, to build on these relationships. Um, and we're not gonna have, uh, obviously, with, like with every partnership, we're not gonna have, uh, as a community, everything we, we like to have. Um, we're gonna have some differences, uh, we're gonna have agreements, but the main thing is to continue to work together. Um, I, uh, my name is, and I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself, my name is Amin Oda, and I'm with uh, Voices of Palestine and the Arab American Community Coalition. I have been working with, uh, uh, with the uh, Muslim and Sikh and Arab Community Council for seven, eight, I can't remember now, it's been too long. Um, but we, um, um, we, like I said, we have um, our goals as community members uh, and, and leaders in the community to achieve. And uh, our law enforcement also has uh, goals to keep the community safe and build these relationships. So we try our best to um, make it happen as much as possible. And like I said, we were gonna we're going to have differences. Um, but again, this, this uh, back to the workshop, this was um, something that we requested. Um, the FBI or the U.S. Attorney's Office or SD did not come and make us have this workshop or force us. I mean, unfortunately, there are concerns out there that this was done by the government. This came uh, because we requested it. We get questions about the federal government and the lo uh, local uh, government about what they do, um, how they work, um, about certain actions, and we take them to our monthly meetings, but they, um, uh, we thought, you know, instead of just doing this on individual basis or cases, it would be nice to have these workshops, and we, I'm hoping we can have more uh, as we go, um, but we can address these concerns, questions, and learn more about them, and also educate them about us. So we welcome your questions and, and feedback, and I'm hoping when we get to the Q&A uh, uh, um, part of the presentation, that you make your questions brief. Um, we don't mind uh, long questions, but please, no speeches. Uh, so there's time for questions, uh, plenty of time, and, and if you have anything specific, maybe about a specific case, or if you don't like to ask in public, you're welcome to ask our presenters or experts after their sessions, uh, either after the session or, or at, the, at the end of the event. Again, thank you for being here and welcome, and let me, uh, introduce uh, Officer Diaz. He's gonna be uh, presenting about SPD and the work that they do with the community. Thank you. So, uh, no, 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 no. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Can everybody hear yeah. I, I tend to talk loud, hopefully I don't talk too loud. Um, I'm Officer Adrian Diaz and I've been on 15 years uh, with Seattle Police Department. I've been seeing a lot of different things in my time. I work patrol downtown and now what I do is community work. I work actually focusing on youth violence prevention and intervention. So we actually, my office doesn't do any level of enforcement. Um, we, we actually just focus on getting kids back in school, working on truancy suspensions, that kind of stuff. But one of the things is, I actually uh, was asked if we could do like a know your rights or understand your rights, because I do this for community policing academies, but I also do this for youth, because for it's important for the community to understand what their rights are and how to better work with the police because then they have a little bit of a power in being able to cope and, re and understand what, are, what the police department policies and how they're gonna do their job. Makes it easier. So, out of this class, 
I might talk a little fast, but um, as we go through, uh, slide, uh, slide, slide, and just keep on hitting it because there's actually sound to this, and I took off the sound because I don't want to scare anybody else with my sound. Um, we're going to identify four main sources of criminal law and procedure. This type, the three types of police citizen contacts, and the justification for those contacts, and then the basic type of searches and legal requirements for each type. So it gives you an understanding of when an officer searches, what they actually have to go through about how to actually document and understand why they're doing what they do. So uh, these are the main sources of criminal procedure. We have our constitution. So the constitution is written. They give us, they afford us the Bill of Rights. So typically in law enforcement, we really focus on the Fourth and Fifth Amendment, search and seizure, that kind of stuff, use of force. So kind of the guiding force. Federal government has the constitution. Then from the federal government, it's, it has three branches. We have the judicial, the executive, and the um, legislative. So legislative enacts laws, executive signs it, judicial interprets it. So, and that's really the judicial part of what we do gives us some context in how we do our job because it sets what they call case law. So from that, so we have statutes and ordinance. That's like, it fits under, like if you were to call 911 and say somebody's in my house, Burglarizing my house, the statute gives us some idea of what law they're violating. Then that case law will help, the judicial branch helps us interpret how we're going to actually handle that case. So back in the day, they had a case called Tennessee versus Gardner. Or before Tennessee versus Gardner, there was a fleeing felon rule. There an officer could shoot a fleeing felon. Tennessee Gardner actually said that now cannot shoot just a fleeing felon, it has to be for a certain level of crime. And that was based on a burglary case. The kid, there was a kid that comes into a house, burglarizes the house, starts running from the police, officer pulls out his gun and shoots him because he thought, well under Tennessee law, it was all right to shoot a fleeing felon. But Tennessee versus Gardner, a case law, the Supreme Court gave us some context in what we can do and why we can do it. And they said, no, you can't just shoot just because somebody's violating a felony law, you can't just shoot, it has to be a certain level of, of law. Gives us some, some context. Department policy. So you have the federal government that has your constitution. The state can be more restrictive. So Supreme Court says that officers can pursue vehicles that, that, uh, that flee for them. So I try to make a traffic stop and the car doesn't stop. Federal law allows me to pursue a vehicle that doesn't stop. State law can say, uh, we only want you to pursue under certain criteria. But my department policy actually says that I'm only going to pursue if it's related to a crime, violent crime, or a certain um, level of, of action, such as maybe like a homicide or uh, a residential, bur an occupied residential burglary. It gives me so it's more restrictive, where the federal government says, if you, uh, if an officer, if you run from an officer in a, in a vehicle, maybe it's for a traffic stop. So do you see how it can be very broad when it comes to the federal statute, but as you come into department policy, it becomes a lot more restrictive. Think of it as a funnel. Is my department policy is now starting to be more restrictive into a little area. And then my judgment and discretion. In judgment and discretion, you wouldn't want an officer to, every time they make a traffic stop, to do a citation. So the officer has a little bit of judgment and discretion about how they're going to handle each and every contact that they make with the community or the public. And so these are all areas. An officer might say, a, a narcotics officer who focuses on drugs, might not deal with small little cases of theft. They might they might go, ah, that's not what I, my job is focusing on. My job is focusing on narcotics. So it's their judgment and discretion that they might focus only on narcotics. So when it comes to context. So the Fourth mm -hmm. Amendment, which is probably the very most important amendment for what we're talking about, the right of the people to be secure in the person's house of paper that affects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. That, it's very broad, but that's the federal government standard. 
The next one is, it should be, this is the Washington State. So the state now has even more restrictive. No person shall be disturbed in its private affairs or its home invaded without authority of law. That actually, so the federal government has their fourth amendment. As you look at Washington State's constitution, this is the Washington State constitution, it's actually, even though it, it, it almost, the language seems to be the same, and maybe it's a little, a little bit more finer to find, or it's a little bit tighter to find, but it's actually more restrictive. For example, in what they will we'll refer to pretextual stops. In this state, or in, this, in, in the other states, you can stop somebody, say, uh, you see them make contact with a drug house, and but you didn't, you didn't actually see any exchange happen, but you believe that there was some sort of criminal activity occurring. And then the, that vehicle then pulls away from the curb, and the officer stops him for the curb violation, for failing to signal into the oncoming traffic, or failing to signal into traffic. The officer pulls on there. So he stops him for the traffic violation, but really he wants to investigate, uh, investigate the, the potential drug activity. In other states, that's, that's what they call, that's within their pretextual stop law. In this state, you cannot do that. You only stop them for the, either the traffic violation, or if you had enough for what they will, and we'll get into it later on, the Terry stop, you can only do one or the other. You can't do both. In other states, you can do both. So our, our constitution is actually more restrictive in how we stop people. So in it, it, that that time in the other states, it gives more, it gives a broader uh, uh, potential for potentially of, of people feeling like they're being racially profiled. In our state, the laws are a lot more restrictive to try and, and limit the amount of that kind of contact happening to try and eliminate the potential uh, uh, thought of racial profile. So consequences for Fourth Amendment. So we have civil liability. So I can be sued. When people say, I'm gonna you know, sue you for your house because you stopped me for no reason. So I can be sued civilly. Criminal. We had an officer that, that was uh, uh, contacting people for drug violations, taking their drugs, and then giving them out. He's now spending time in federal prison. Um, and that was up to that was and that was a Seattle police officer, and that was I believe nine years ago, and uh, he spent time in federal prison for that. We did actually a sting. That guy helped us out, and uh, and, we, and so so you can imagine officers do get charged criminally for for actions that they they violate the Fourth Amendment. Department policy or department liability. You can if I violate somebody's Fourth Amendment right. I can, I'm held by department standards. The department can end up disciplining me all the way up into including termination. So if I, if I go and stop somebody, and it, I knew that it wasn't going to be, a, it wasn't a justified stop, they can say, you know, Officer Diaz, based on what you did, we, we think that maybe you need some more training. They can train me, and I could be held under that. Or they say, you know, what you did was completely egregious, and what you did in, in stopping that, we don't ever want that to occur, and we're going to fire you. So, Department of Liability can reach all the way up to including termination. Exclusionary rule. And this is this is how many people watch CSI? And are all those little shows that you know, all those crime shows on TV? They, I, I'll always say that half the, probably the majority of those shows, everybody's violating. The exclusionary rule. They go out, they search homes, they do all these things because they got to do it in 30 minutes or an hour. And so, and they get the case and they try to prosecute it, but half the time they're doing searches that they probably shouldn't be doing. They're entering homes that they shouldn't be. And if you were to actually operate that way in a court of law, they would start throwing out your evidence. And that's the exclusionary rule. It is where I, I get evidence that I attained. Say if I ask this gentleman, you know, I need to see what's in your pocket. And he pulls, all of a sudden he pulls out 10 grams of raw cocaine. And I had no justification for wanting, because you know, I said, I need to see what's in your pocket. 
then I, I uh, did an unreasonable search or seizure, correct? And he pulls it out and I grab it and I go, oh, you know, I'm gonna charge you with this and I arrest him. And he's gonna say, well, the officer had no reason to search me. And he's gonna, he's right. I didn't have no reason because I ordered him to do something without any probable cause and I can lose my evidence out of that. He ends up getting off on his case and then he goes, I'm gonna, char I'm gonna charge Officer Diaz with my civil suit because I don't want his house. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. But he offered to show you. No, if I no. But, but yeah, true. But if I said I need to see what's in your pocket, now I'm telling you what to do. Now if I say, you know, sir, can I see what's in your pocket? I'm asking you to. And then it goes on consent. Because wow. so there's a difference. That's how you phrase it. It's exactly how I phrase it, and we'll get into that, because there's that's a whole little idea. A whole little way. So we'll go to the next year. Okay. So that, those were the federal ways of how you could be held accountable for, uh, for your violations, but there's also consequences if you violate Washington State Constitution. There's strict liability for it. This, is, this might be common in what this happened. I know a case that happened in the 1960s where a, uh, there was a grow uh, operation down in eastern Washington, and, and at the time the police department decided, well, we need to stop that growth, so they went and took a plane, put a bunch of chemical agents in to kill off the, the, the grow operation, and flew it over, killed all of what's you know, all of the plants and stuff. But they, they called it, they, they actually filed under the uh, liability tort. They said, that's extremely dangerous. What the police department did shouldn't have, they, they should have tried to requ uh, recover the stuff, but they don't go out and try to kill it with a chemical agent because you're putting everybody in danger. And so they thought that that was an extremely dangerous way of trying to do it, so they got sued under strict liability. Now, intentional tort. So, purposeful behavior, I call it this wrongful death. We had an officer uh, years and years ago running with his gun. Uh, the, the, uh, he had a suspect running after or running away from him. He was running with his gun. Accidentally, the gun went off, shot and killed the person. He needed to try and catch somebody. So his action was he was doing a purposeful behavior and trying to capture somebody in the context of what he was doing. But in how it happened, he didn't intend to kill him so that he could be charged under wrongful death. Negligent tort. Inadvertent behavior, and I always relate this to emergency of vehicle operations because if people are driving and they hear those sirens, right? You're supposed to pull over to the right, right? So all of a sudden, officers will go, you know, you'll see them coming into oncoming traffic sometimes to move through, through traffic to get where they're going, right? They, they're trying, they have the sirens on, lights on, and they're trying to move through traffic. But an officer decides he's got to get to this call, and he decides to go to the right and then try to go around him. He causes an accident. He knows that the traffic is going to end up moving to the right because when you hear lights and sirens, that we're told, we tell the public, Right, but what his actions were, he he did he operated that vehicle in a manner that he shouldn't. So he was negligent. You try to do your best you can and stuff. You try to get through traffic, but you got to make sure everything's clear. Okay, so he could be sued under this area. So, oh, go he or the department? Well, both. And, and when you get a suit, it's like everybody. So it's not just like, and I've been sued, and so it's normal, and, and as a police officer, it's normal to be sued. I, I don't know many officers that don't get sued in their time. Um, but when you get sued, because uh, I was at WTO, so I, not only I got sued, my wife got sued, the mayor's got sued, the mayor's wife got sued. When they look at the whole rap sheet of all the people that are getting sued, it's like everybody gets sued. Now, once they actually go to court, they start to maneuver it down and start to figure out who's who's more viable and everything. But but when you first initial see your suit, and when the first time I saw mine, it's like, Kelly, you're getting sued. And I'm my, my wife. And she's like, what? I, I didn't do anything. I, you're married to me. So <laughs> that's part of the problem already. You're married to me. So you made the bad decision there. So, But um, but yeah, it, it, that's normal when you first look at your suits. Everybody seems to get sued, and then they start to narrow it down and figure out who's actually liable for what actions happen. 
and then they'll start narrowing it down, and then it might be usually usually the officer, usually the chief, and then usually the mayor might still stay in there, but usually the department. So it's usually like three or four people will stay in that suit, and then eventually we'll weed it down even more. And stuff. So types of police citizen contacts, there, I, I will refer to three because these are the main three. Uh, there's non-custodial interviews and stuff, but I don't go into that as much. Social contact, Terry stop, and arrest. That's pretty much the three types of contacts that you're going to come and encounter with an officer. Social contact. So what level of justification is required and what authority does the officer have? So if I was to say what a social contact, if I was to ask you what a social contact might be, what do you think it might be? Anybody? So yeah, so. so we're at there, everything's kind of consensual. I go up and I, I, I can talk to you about how I hope the Huskies win today because they're playing Hawaii and that they're, they didn't do very good last week on the passing off it. I can talk to you about anything. I can ask you anything. You, if you want to talk to me and you want to have that conversation, it's up to you. We can have an open conversation under social contact. He might choose not to have a contact. He might say, Officer Diaz, I appreciate you coming and talk to me, but you, you, know, you can pounce down. I don't really want to talk to you. Okay. And I, you know, I, I'm going to do my best to try and talk to him because police work does happen in, in social contact. I, when I, I, as I spent, you know, seven and a half, eight years downtown patrol, I would make a lot of contact with people on the street, just talking with them, and find out different information. And I had to build relationships with them, and I got to know who they were. And all of a sudden, when it came, when all of a sudden something happened, I knew who to contact. I knew who to make, who, who to talk with. So I recovered a lot of different things because of the social contact. So it's a good tool for officers. The officer doesn't have really any level of authority. You're able to walk away at any time. You're able to not talk with them at any time. The power is yours. The power is the community. The power is the person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's, you're gonna, that would be the next one we're going to talk about. Because that's going to be under actual Terry stuff. And, and, and we'll go with that. Quick question. Um, let's say you stop somebody for a uh, week of turn. Okay. And, but you knew he was at the crack house. Mm -hmm. But you cannot stop him for that. Correct. But you go talk to the passport ID or whatever, and you see the crack bike, right? On the passport. Okay, now, now you're going into different waters. Okay, so just like DUI, drinking and driving. Yeah. I stopped somebody. So what? And, and I should go. I should actually move that. Wait and wait. Can I? Can I ta table that? Because that'll actually go into our Terry stop. Okay. So in social contact, I'll give you some other context. If if I go over and I say, because what we just we just had a scenario just right now. If I say, sir, can I ask you for your ID? Can I, see your ID? Yeah. Can I see your ID? Yeah. Okay. So it, it's, it's consensual, right? Yeah. Under, under social contact, no problem. He shows me his ID, and I go, okay. And I look at it, and I say, okay, in my head, I'm imprinting. I might, I might even write it down, but I don't leave his sight. And I give him back the ID. I go, okay, well, you have a nice day, sir. And I go back to my car. And I punch his name in, and all of a sudden, a warrant comes up. And I go, oh, sir, sir, I, I need you to talk to you because you have a warrant. And I actually make an arrest. Now he has that 10 grams of cocaine in his pocket that he didn't, you know, forgot he had. He was holding it for some friend he didn't know. And, uh, and so he, all of a sudden I go, you're under arrest. I handcuff him up. I search him into arrest. And I say, oh, you have 10 grams of raw cocaine. You're, sir, you're being arrested for an investigation of what they call a BUXA, violation of Uniform Controlled Substance Act. And from that point on, you're also being arrested for the warrant as well. So he's going to go to court, and he's going to say the officer had no reason to stop. Him. And I'm going to tell I'm going to tell the court I asked him for his ID, 
and he gave me consent, he gave me his ID. He handed me his ID. And I gave it back to him. I didn't hold it for a long period of time. He was able to, he was able to walk away at any time because it was all consent. The courts are going to say, under case law, and this wasn't the actual case under that. There's actually another case, but state, uh, not the state versus mode, but there's another case. And the case law will say, the officer is correct. He didn't make the stop. Now, you might have felt like you weren't free to go, but because I asked you the question, and I actually, you know, I didn't leave you, I didn't go back to my car and wait, make you wait, you had the opportunity to walk away, and so that was a social contact. And so me actually getting, recovering that narcotics, you're going to end up being charged with it, probably go to jail. So, next one. So this is where we're at next. Terry stops. It must be recognized that whenever a police officer accosts an individual and restrains his freedom to walk away, they seize that person. And that case law is Terry versus Ohio. National case. There's, there's nothing that, that's pretty much what regulates what officers are, have the ability to stop. So, in your context, we get a call of a robbery that occurred at the AM Finium Mini Mart, or we'll just say, or the 7 Eleven right here. And they say that three Hispanic males are running, that ran from the scene, they ran southbound. Okay? So officers are going in the area, and what they're looking for are, and then they say three Hispanic males, and they're wearing white shirts, blue jeans, and a set of blue shoes. So officers, and all of a sudden you see six different people that are in this area, as the officers pull into this area, all wearing that, all that clothing description. Officers are going to stop all of them. If it matches, if it's, if it's coming close to matching that description. Then they're going to go over to the 7-Eleven, and they're going to pick up a witness or a victim, and they're going to bring them out to the location. And they're going to say, do you see anybody, that, or do you recognize anybody? And they'll leave it at that. They're not going to say, do you recognize any, anybody that you know, went into your place? And do, they're, not gonna, they're just going to say, do you recognize anybody? If they say, yeah, I recognize this, this, and this, this gentleman, the officers are they're going to start to establish their probable cause to arrest. The other individuals, they'll probably have already ran their name, because that's what we initially we do, is we don't always check the name. Now, if that person, say person that was innocent, it wasn't associated with the robbery, but we run that name, and all of a sudden, dur during that process, we find out that person has a warrant, he's probably going to go to jail. So even though he might not have been associated with the robbery, but because he matched the description initially, and, and we, during that process we ran his name, he's probably going to go for that one. Does that make sense? So he, he might be almost an innocent victim in the sense that he matched that description. What's the term for stopping people and holding them? What is that called? They call it a terror stop. That, oh, that is that's a terror stop. So, so when I make a stop on somebody, that's a terror stop. Officers might use a different a different term depending on what they're actually, you know, like they might call it, I might be out with a suspicious man. I might be out on the robbery. I have, you know, I have, I have three people that are matching that description. They might say I'm on a shake. They might say, you know, it, it, officers come up with all sorts of different language. In, in how we, you know, what we're doing, you know, depending on the call. Is it the same thing as stopping somebody for speed? It, it is. So, like, when I go on a um, traffic stop, what you hear over radio is going to be, you know, my call sign. So, it might have been, like, 2 Mary 2. My call sign now is 995. So, I might say 995 on stop. So, that's, now, I, now I've told radio that I am on a traffic stop. So, it's going to be the same regulation now. This is how it gets confusing because law is confusing. Uh, people go to school for lost years and they study for lost years and they still can never stay on top of it as much as they need to. Um, so, can click one more time. So, Terry, stop. So, what level of justification? I have to know that I, I have to believe that somebody's involved in criminal activity or about to be involved in criminal activity. So, if I see four guys 
all huddled together, and they've got all got spray paint, and they've got this area that they want they want to hit. I probably believe that they're probably going to be in spray paint, right? I might believe that they're they're ready to do their tagging or whatever. So I might, as an officer, I'm seeing that I'm going to go over and contact, check up. I'm going to do a Terry stop because I believe that they might be involved in property damage because they've got all their spray cans, got all the stuff that they're ready to do. Okay. Once I find out that they're they're just, you know, they were painting the wall and the business agreed to it, I'm, I'm going to say, have a nice day. So it gives me enough time to investigate to find out what they're doing, and then once I find out that it's not anything criminal, I'm going to end up using the loan. Um, what if you have um, somebody call in and they don't So that's so there's there's and I'll give you a couple of different things scenarios. So if you're saying, a, say you call, and the, and the officer's going to have to what they call the Aguilar and Spinelli rule, they're going to have to find out how you know what drug dealing looks like. There and you can say, I've been living on this corner, and I've been sitting for like last five years. They come in, people come in, they start making deals. I don't necessarily see the actual drugs change hands or whatever, but I see money, what I believe money, they make calls, they do look out, they do all these things. They're gonna say, okay, we, we find that you to be a very credible witness. And so they're gonna go, okay, based on your information, we're gonna, we're gonna make that stop. Now, if you say, I don't, I, I, they're, they're dealing drugs, but I don't want anybody, I don't want the officers to come and contact me. I just, I don't wanna be contacted because I'm afraid that that if the officers come and contact me, those people will attack me. So the officers are not gonna be able to make that stop. They're gonna have to have their own, they're gonna have to develop their own suspicion of whether they can stop them or not. So that means that they might park at an area, they might get up on a roof, they might get up in different areas and they might look over and see what's going on because they've gotta establish their own credibility. They've gotta establish what they believe, what they're seeing. So you might have given them the tip but because you said you didn't, you want it to be anonymous, the officer has to establish his own. And so it might take a little bit more. It limits the officer's ability a little bit when people are not necessarily wanting to be a witness. And if we understand it, it just gives us a little bit less power to be able to go forward on a criminal case such, or a, on a Terry stop such as that. Does that make sense? Does that give some? So, so yeah. So. Say on a traffic stop, so I'm making a stop, uh, for kind of like a Terry stop, I make a stop. Now I'm stopping the driver for red light violation, okay? All the three passengers in the car are, they all have their seat belts on, so I'm not stopping them. One of the passengers says, officer, I need to go to my, my uh, martial art practice, or I need to go to my swim lesson. And he goes, I'd like to leave. The officer, you know, say, I'm not stopping you. You're free to leave. Now, officer said, officer sees, you know, makes a stop. Different scenario. Officer makes a traffic stop. Driver, driver's for a stop for red light violation. Passenger doesn't have a seatbelt. Now the officer is going to stop, could potentially stop the passenger for not having a seatbelt, under a seatbelt violation. So he's going to ask that passenger, name, date of birth, ID, they might say that, they might just ask for an identification, and that. When I make a traffic stop, I am only stopping that person. So if all of a sudden, and this changed a couple years ago, we will State versus Grande. When I stop the vehicle, and say, all of a sudden I get up to the vehicle, and they roll down the windows, and a big puff of marijuana smoke comes right out, and I go, whoa, if somebody's been smoking something that... Yeah, so this is really strong. And they go, oh, no, no, officer, I, I don't know. A skunk came in through my car, and I <laughs> ran out. I couldn't figure out what it was. So I go, oh, OK. Before, we could actually arrest everybody in the car. 
we actually had, and you could just say, okay, everybody is, must be associated with this, I'm going to arrest everybody. We cannot do that now. Under State versus Grande, they say now we have to have our own reason to stop each, and we have to justify each and every person in that car to stop them. So, if all of a sudden we see the driver throw the, the bud or, uh, to the back passenger, we're probably going to stop him too because he's probably got the marijuana now. But we have to justify it. Everyone has to have their own legal justification for, the, for why they're being stopped. So, um, so does that give you some context and understanding that just because I'm stopping the vehicle, all the people inside the vehicle are not necessarily being stopped now. You have to have your own. So, last question. Yeah, yeah. I don't know it's not an intent on that, but uh, let's just say that officers stop somebody for some kind of minor traffic. Yeah. And the officer told them this is a warning, but it's still getting ticket. The if it's a warning, then it's a warning it, it's a it's a what they call a warning ticket. And it doesn't it, you'll actually see like warning citation on it. If it says like you have to fill it out to court, then then you're getting a ticket. He wasn't giving you a warning. But he stated that it was a warning. Doesn't matter. He's giving you a ticket, so so it's it's actually a ticket. It's bound by court. So even though he might say that, he might he might have just slipped and said it by accident. You could try to say, well, judge, he, he told me that he was going to give me a warning, and now I got this ticket. The judge might say, mm, I'll give you a break too, but but it doesn't matter. Whether he says it's a warning, if he gives you a citation, it's a citation. Well, the incident is he was stopped for a minor, for a minor uh, traffic violation. Yeah. Then he was arrested. How do you think that situationally? Yeah. Was being uh, stopped that way? Yeah, because you, you thought that he well, stopped you for that, but he really wanted to know what you were doing, and specifically probably because you know the race or whatever. So, um, but he had that stop, and if, if he cited you, that that ticket is bound. I mean, even if he said that he's giving a warning. That ticket, whatever he wrote on that ticket is down. So, uh, so Terry stopped in the interest which underlies the recognition that a police officer may in appropriate circumstances or in an appropriate manner approach a person for purposes, purposes of investigating possibly criminal behavior even though there's no probable cause to make an arrest. So on a Terry stop, I don't have to have enough to say I'm arrested. Okay. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm actually finished. So. Um, so, okay, so if I understand correctly, um, if individuals are in a vehicle, um, you, you have to have individuals out there for the stop of what we call speed. Yeah. But if they're actually walking on the street, you can stop, you can seize all of them. It all depends. If all of a sudden I, and this was very common because I used to work when I was downtown, I used to work a lot on our narcotics, undercover narcotics. You would have a group of people, three or four people standing, and all of a sudden, when I go to make a contact, maybe two have joined them. I haven't seen them do anything, so I'm gonna probably end up telling them, you need to get out of here until, until, or you need to step away until I can, I, I need to talk to these, these three people that I, I have probable, or I have uh, a reasonable suspicion to stop. So I might say, you can step over there if you wanna wait for your friends, no problem, but they'll come over in this area until, I, until I'm done talking. And if they keep on coming over, I'm like, I told you once, I told you twice. Now I'm gonna, now, now I'm gonna have to have a conversation because now you're infringing on what I'm trying to do. So, so there are people that sometimes they will come into it and then they will get stopped because they're not giving the officer the, the lead time to, to investigate. But typically, you have to justify each and every stop. So if if I don't justify it. Say if a couple people come in and I didn't justify why they were, why I'm stopping them, then what I find is, is that I go back to the exclusionary rule. If all of a sudden I make an arrest and I uncover some sort of drugs or guns or whatever, my those, those drugs or guns might be thrown out and when I go to court. So what 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 if you stop this two or three or four? If you, if you, and, and this is where, this is what I tell you, if you have any question about whether you have the right to walk away, ask the officer, am I free to go? Ask that officer, it's probably, 
I, I tell I tell you, I tell adults, I tell everybody, if you ask that question and the officer says you're free to go, then you know that it was a so that they that the only way they're talking to that person is under social contact. If they say no, you're not free to go, then you know you're being stopped. So then you know that the officer has to justify that level of stop. And could you just share a little on what has happened with most students And it's always hard because every officer is different. Police work is done in 500 different ways. It's never done in the same manner. I, in, in how I might deal with somebody, I might deal with out of 100 people, 99 people out of the same way. But that one person might end up changing the dynamic. Of, if they're agitated, they might change the dynamics of how I try to de-escalate it. Maybe they, they start off so agitated that I'm not able to de-escalate, and then I might have to use force. Or in the other 99 people, I was able to just, based on the context, based on the call, I was able to just kind of talk them down out of whatever they were asking. Hey, relax. It's all, hey, it, give, me sec, give me a second. I'll explain to you what I'm, what I'm doing. But until I, until I have this time to do what I'm doing, just calm down. Because you, you, what you're doing is you're creating a, you know, a conversation that doesn't need to be. And I might just try to talk them, just trying to keep them calm throughout the whole circumstance. But not every call is the same, not every person you're dealing with is in the same manner. So you're trying to do your best, but you hope and you hope to have a positive outcome that everyone stays calm. But what we're responding to, you never know what we're responding to. So that's the harder part, is you don't know who we're, you know, we don't know who we're dealing with, who we're talking with, what they have. We had an officer and and uh, an officer who had made contact with a lot of different people, a lot of gang members. And they, he responded to a shooting, knew a lot of different people, and he had a good relationship with a lot of the people he did. But at that time, he didn't know, the officer didn't know that that guy had killed somebody earlier in that night, a couple hours before. So when he asked him to talk with them, the officer was then you know, pushed off and then shot and killed. It was actually a Kid County deputy, good friend. But so we don't know at what point somebody is what they what what has happened to get them there agitated, and so we're trying to do our best to calm things down. But what we have to say is that it has to be mutual. We have to have people comply with some with some level of respect, and we also, as officers, have to do the same thing. And that's a harder time too for officers too to try it. when somebody's agitated mm -hmm. in front of you. Sometimes it's harder for for you to try and stay calm and say calm things down because you're like, I've got to have a certain level of control. I've got to do this certain level of job and and they don't understand. So you're you're, you're having two competing forces. And that's a lot that's hard. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I what I wanted to really say is it's difficult. And 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 then trying to compete with everybody in every situation is different. Right. Yeah, it does answer but I'm curious now, is there There, there is, people will call it, officers will call it like furtive behavior, um, but I, even that, that's too vague. Though, I mean, what I, what I look at is, because a lot of times people will go, in my culture, it's very custom for me to look in your eyes. Some will say, no, it's very custom for me to not look in your eyes, and it's, or some will say, based on like personal space, some people like to be here, some people like to be here. And everything is, it, so there's a lot of different things where if somebody's coming very close to me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like, why are they coming so close to me? That I have, I have a little bit of space. I don't want to be too far. I don't want to be contacting each other this way. But I do want a little bit of space so I can have freedom to move around. So there's some of that. I'm also looking for, when, when I contact somebody, if they start to look like this, I know that they're probably looking 
either to run or they're probably looking to potentially fire me. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to get me to, to get my impression to know where they might be going. And then a lot of times, if you look at a lot of people in fighting, in street fights and stuff, you'll see them kind of do this and then they'll throw a hail like this. They might not see what they're hitting, but they're, they're, they're kind of like trying to get you into that, in that area. And so I'm looking for how their eyes are moving, where their bodies are moving, what's, what's their action, are they fidgety? You know, are they you know, moving their hands, you know, going to their pockets, or what, are, what kind of actions are they doing? Because that could be a sign of being high on the pipes. Could be just a sign that, that they're just nervous, that they're not used to talking with police. And so there's no like, there's no set diagram, but if, if you look at all of those kind of factors and then try to see what fits in with the context of the call, or why you're making that stop, or why you're making that social contact, or why you're talking to that person, um, for a variety of reasons. But uh, yeah, I'm looking at eye, hand movement. Nervousness, gestures, different things, what are the people doing? So voice and tone level. Voice and tone. I mean, yeah, I, I mean like my, my old partner, his wife was Vietnamese. And just by the, the voice inflection of a word, it changes the word two to three different you know, meanings. And, and so he, he goes, oh, and I go, it's, it's like going home to my wife. You know, she could say hi in three different ways. And I know exactly which way it is. If it's like hi, no, it's like oh, I'm gonna. I know. I just, uh, honey, uh, can I go get something to eat? <laughs> you know, but it, it's it, you know based on that voice inflection that 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 might end up being okay. It's gonna be confrontational, or you know, somebody goes, oh hi, how you doing? That's very calming, very soothing, and very relaxing. And I might, you know, uh, now I can establish a rapport. So, but based on based on words and voice inflection, I might be already trying to read that and see how I can use that in the best manner. But not every every way is going to be the perfect way. Because somebody might say hi to me in a, in a nice manner, and then might want to you know, stab me or kill me either too. So you, you try to do it as best you can. Oh, sorry, but uh, you can interrupt. We have ten more minutes till the end of this session. So. I'm not sure how much you have. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll get Maybe we'll let you finish first, and we can wait on the question. Okay. And please, yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, arrest, so people go, oh, you had no probable cause to stop me. Well, actually, probable cause is to arrest. So what they mean by probable cause is, is that there has to be a crime that has been committed, and that person is more likely to have committed that crime. So, for example, if, if I go to... Westwood Village, there's a target, or actually Northgate, right here, there's a target. And somebody says that somebody, this gentleman stole makeup. He's got a bald head, he's wearing kind of a beige and blue shirt with blue jeans and brown and black shoes. I don't know why he's still in makeup, but maybe his wife needs something, maybe he wants to put on something, I don't know. But, and they go, we have him on video. And the security's following him outside the door. He made no attempt to pay for the items. So I get there and I go, I go and stop him, right? I do my cherry stop because initially, right now, the, the security's following him. All of a sudden I see him, I go, he matches the description. I make that contact. I said, I talk to him first. I say, you know, I'm talking to you because Tari just called about a theft. Security runs up and goes, that's him, that's him. And I, I might say, do you have evidence? I mean, do you have video? You said you have video. Do you have, what do you have? And I saw him put it in his pocket. I say, okay, sir, you're under arrest. I'll make an arrest because I believe that he committed the theft. And then from that point on, I do what they call search incident to arrest. And all of a sudden, I pop out the makeup. He goes, oh, I don't have the receipt because uh, I lost the receipt. You lost the receipt <laughs> last 10 feet or whatever it is. And he goes, yeah, I just don't know what I did with the receipt. Okay, well. We have you on video. Target has you on video to say that you committed this. So I now make probable cause. I now have established probable cause because I have evidence, video, witness statement, and then now I have the makeup that's also recovered as well. Did, you have, did he have to show you the makeup? Did you? No. He didn't have to. No. Because I have a witness that says that he did it, and then he says that he has a video that also establishes it. So now I've said, okay, now search into arrest. Now I've recovered it. Now I'll go, oh, here's the merchandise. 
I might take pictures of it, give it back to them because they're probably going to want to sell it or whatever. And then I might, I might just take the picture, put it in evidence and say this is what I recovered from this left front pocket or whatever. What if he doesn't have that computer in his possession at the time? Then I might, it, it all depends, then I might, I might have to look at the video and say, and see what, what they do have. And, and then I'm, I'm going to establish whether I have probable cause. He might have thrown it in the trash can on his way out. Or gave it to someone. So I'm going to have to look back and see what they have. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to determine whether I have enough to arrest him or not. I have, right now have enough to detain him, no but, matter but what. But you see him pick it up. You see him leaving the store without it. And he doesn't have it. So I put it back in the wrong, on the wrong shelf. Yeah, and so, but I have enough to at least detain him under a Terry stop. But I still have, I'm going to have to go back and find out if I actually have enough to make a probable cause arrest. So, yeah, it's all about evidence then. So, uh, so this is, and if there's any lawyers in here, don't, don't, don't uh, hurt me on this one. Uh, this is only a guideline. Uh, I always say that, that this is really a social contact. Okay, we have no reason to believe that anything's going on. But, I should change it because it's not no reason to believe. We just say that's a social contact area. We don't have any authority uh, to make a stop. Reasonable suspicion really kind of fits in this area about 20, 25% area. Kind of gives us a guideline. We have to have that we believe that somebody's involved in criminal activity. Probable cause doesn't have to be 50%. We just have to know that a crime has been committed and that person is more likely to have committed that crime. But it doesn't need to be 50% that he's guilty of that crime. Now, this is a civil standard. This is preponderance of the evidence. So O.J. Simpson wasn't found guilty under beyond a reasonable doubt under the criminal standard, but he was found guilty based on preponderance of evidence. So really, it's kind of like over 50%, but it's a still a gray area. Now, it, for a criminal standard, for me, even though I have probable cause to arrest somebody for, say, homicide, was this standard, but for me to actually convict them, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. So some will say, some will sometimes think that this is a standard for me for them to be arrested, but it isn't. It's only the standard for them to be convicted. This is a standard for the arrest. And then these are this is beyond all doubt. That means that they, everyone they say, I'm guilty. I did it, 100 percent. That's all me. I take responsibility, and that, that's beyond all doubt. But there's no legal criminal standard for that. So. Source of the objective facts. Keep on clicking, keep on clicking. So we have officer's observations. Keep on clicking. And I think two more. Okay. Oh, go back. Uh, so officer's experience, training, collective knowledge, furtive behavior, suspect statements, prior record, physical evidence, witness statements, and officer. These are all objective facts. So that means that they, I might say I've been a narcotic. Say I'm making an arrest for narcotics. Under 15 years of narcotics, I've made over 3,000 arrests in narcotics. I've you know, gone through undercover school. I've done this. I've done that. I, I worked in Peru under the national t uh, drug units and I've done this. And I, you know, so all of that experience is going to go in. And so when they actually say, do you have knowledge about, about drugs, all, of that, all my training experience is going to be uh, an objective fact to it. So for the behavior. If I'm in a, if I'm making a stop on a on a vehicle, it's late at night and the, the guy keeps on, you know, all, typically you see the release in the back of the head. But if I keep on seeing it going like this, that action might be consistent of going underneath the actual car seat. So I might go, I need you to step out of the car. Why? Because I might believe that there's going to be some sort of object that, or weapons that he might try to act, have access to. So that furtive behavior might set me at a different standard. Uh, we won't go through all because we'll keep on going. Is race an objective fact? So this is the case law. U.S. versus Batista indicates that appearance, including race and any and other physical attributes, may be relevant in forming a suspicion of criminal activity. Racial incongruity, however, is now, never relevant in forming such a suspicion. State versus uh, Barber. So this means that if somebody calls 911 and says. I've got three black males that I believe are, are selling drugs on the corner over there. We're probably going to stop three black males because of the context of the call. We have that, we're using that as a somewhat of an identifier. However, I can't go, oh, I'm on Mercer Island. 
You say, uh, well, Mershon, and I go, there's three black males walking on Mershon. Uh, that can't, you can't stop them because that, that isn't, you're using race as the only factor in making that stop. And then that would, that was, if you were to find stuff or whatever it was, all that gets thrown out, and then the officer should be charged. Because you can't make the stop just based on what person's race are, just because you feel like they're out of place. Types of searches, search warrant, consent, exigent circumstance, incident to arrest, and frisk. So, search warrant, I have to go to a judge to get somebody, a judge to sign off, to, and they have to have, I have to establish probable cause in a search warrant. So my standard, my standard is that of somebody committing that crime, and then that uh, their person will likely commit that crime. Now consent, remember we talked about this at the very beginning. If I ask him, can I see what's in your pocket, and he pulls it out, he can still, he can be charged with it, but it was all based on consent. As you get circumstance, I go and do in my search warrant, and I knock on the door, and all of a sudden I hear running, and then I hear toilets flushing. I might have to enter in that house quicker, because what it, under a search warrant, if we're if we're doing a you know a knock uh, search warrant where SWAT comes in, they're gonna knock, they're gonna do is you know. So please search warrant, and then they're gonna and they're gonna wait for that person to have enough time to get from wherever they're at, a reasonable amount of time to get for that to the open door. It's I know in, in TV they just ran the door, and in the old days that's the way we did it as well. But now we have to wait a, a level of time for them to actually for the person to get. If it's a two-story house, a reasonable amount of time for that person to get from that location to the front door. But if we start hearing toilets flushing, we're going to get in there quicker. Now, if you have uh, a one bedroom, which in downtown, when I did you know, the narcotics stuff, when we did a search warrant, it was a one, it wasn't even a bedroom, it was, it was just like an open area. It was only like maybe 200 square feet, 300 square feet places. So to get to the door only took maybe one or two seconds. So we would have to wait at least one or two seconds for them to get to the door and then before we enter. So, as you have circumstances without, uh, with or without timely police action, evidence may be removed or destroyed. The delay could harm a person who was injured or a person could escape. So those are the standards that we have to have for edging in circumstances. Um, uh, no, uh, right there. So plain route versus open view. Plain view versus open. Plain has the legal right to be there. So if, if I say, I go up to your house and we're letting you know, people know about different things that are going on in the community. He goes, oh, Officer Diaz, come on in. I want to, you know, want to have a comment. I want to talk to you. I enter in the house. I have a legal right to be there. And all of a sudden, he's got cocaine on his wall. I'm like, uh, sir, you realize you have cocaine on your dresser drawers and stuff like that. He gave me the legal right to be there. But now I'm in a place where I can actually recover. I, I, and actually, what I would do is I would actually get a search warrant. I would actually remove him from the place and arrest him and then but he gave me legal right to be there. Now, open view is where I walk to what a public area or where area people believe is public. Say I walk up to the front door and the wind, sh the wind blind or the, the blinds are open and, I, and then you can see there's cocaine on top of the dresser door. And as I'm walking up, I see it and I go, okay, I'm in an open place. Now I know that I believe that's suspected to be, you know, narcotics and now I'm going to end up doing a search warrant and trying to recover those narcotics. But I can't, I'm not in that area where I can actually recover. Does that make sense, the two different separations between open view and plain view? Yes. So, Miranda writes, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to speak to an attorney and have, to have an attorney present during any questioning. If you not afford a lawyer, one will be appointed to provide you at, at government expenses of Miranda versus Arizona. There's a misconception uh, that, I, that every case that a Seattle police officer does, that you have to be read your Miranda rights. I don't have to read the Miranda rights if I'm not asking you any questions. So if I say, if I, if I arrest this gentleman for theft, and I don't ask him any questions about theft, 
I'm not having to read because I'm not asking him to invoke his Fifth Amendment right. So, where he can self-incriminate himself. I'm not asking him to do that. So I might just arrest him based on the evidence that I have, and he might go to jail. Now, if I say, if I arrest, if I say he's, he goes, Officer Diaz, I, I have a friend that, that, uh, that committed a homicide, or I, he goes, Officer Diaz, I, I committed a homicide. I'll be like, wait a minute here, stop. I'm gonna read him his rights. Because now he's offering, or he's saying the information that I might have to use in court, and so I'm gonna end up stopping that. Sir, stop. You have the right to remain silent on anything, and I'm gonna read him his rights. And then, and then at the end of, of that, I'd say, sir, knowing these rights, would you like to talk to me? And he says, yes, Officer Diaz, I really, I need to get this out of my chest. I killed somebody. So I, all of that information that he said can be used in court. Now, if I, if I just say, you're going to jail for theft, and he goes, but I didn't mean to do it. I just didn't have the money. And I, he offered that. That statement can be offered. But I'm going to say, sir, I understand that. But hold tight. And then I read, read him as Miranda. So people can offer information up, but I'm going to, at some point, have to say, stop if I want to include more information. Does that make sense? I know it's a lot of information right now to you. Uh, any questions? So let's go, let's go to the questions. I know I had a question back there, and I don't see. And actually, and instead of, and I would I would ask this question: If, if somebody, if, a, if an officer goes up to you and says, you know, can I see your ID? I'd ask, sir, am I free to go? And if he says no, he go, okay, then you're being stopped. So, sir, what am I, can I know what I'm being stopped for? And then you, during that time, be pulling out your wallet because you are being stopped. So, you, you are I, that way. It's you know clean, and you're not trying to go. No, officer, I don't because. He does, he has access to, to be able to get your name, date of birth. Now, you don't have to say what you did or that you didn't do anything. You don't have to say any of that. You can just answer. The only things you have to answer are your name, date of birth, and maybe an address if they're trying to figure out where you live. That's it. They don't, you're not, they're, they're, you don't have to answer and say, oh, Muhammad, we know that, that you know, we believe that you were involved in that drug, tra you know, drug trafficking or whatever. And we think that you're doing that. Officer, I don't, I'm not talking about anything. I don't know what you're talking about. You don't have to answer it. You don't have to answer any of that. The only things that you do have to answer under Terry Stop, name, age, of birth, and that kind of stuff. But you don't have to answer anything related to the court investigation. I'd love to share your comments. I'm sorry. I'd love to share your comments. Thank you. But this is presentation available for public to see or uh, yeah. is information? So I, have, I do a lot of these classes. I do a lot of classes for youth. I do a lot of classes for adults. We do this at CPA. We do this all kind of, we try to do as much. 600,000 people in the city of Seattle, probably another 400,000 that do our services or use our services. So we're probably not able to reach it, is the number that we really like. This is really to give you some context. I don't portray to be a, a, a lawyer or an expert in this, but I do know enough that I try to give you guys enough to have some level of power, mm -hmm. and really the power is is knowing whether you're being stopped and whether you and asking the important question, "Am I free to go?" Because once you know that you're whether you're free to go or not, then then that gives you some understanding of okay, this is what I have to provide, and that's what on our Terry stop you'd have to provide name, date of birth, that kind of stuff, so we can identify you, mm -hmm. but you don't have to provide anything that's criminal. I'm talking about the yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Information is available for public. It's fair. I mean, yeah. People ask me for it, I have no problem. I'm not, I don't have any legal rights to it or anything. I don't go on this. Right. So, but I hope, I hope, uh, did we get, did she come back? Did she, did you have a question? I think you had her earlier. At what point did you face At what point did you face Okay. At what point do you face that's a whole use of force class, so I'd hate to give you throw it out of context. I, I mean, and I actually, and I'll give you some, how I got into this teaching constitutional law is my actual expertise is use of force. 
Um, I, I used to teach uh, for the academy. Um, I had only been on about a year and a half, and I started teaching the academy because I had a big martial arts background. And, and actually, I used to train with uh, uh, Sergeant Davis over here. And uh, so I started doing use of force, and then I started, when you, when you look at cases of use of force, it always went back to one thing. Did the officer have the justification to make the stop? So I started teaching, I started looking at constitutional law, and I started teaching constitutional law. Really in this, if I have enough to stop somebody, so like if I have enough to stop you, and I'm asking you to comply with me, and you start struggling, it depends on, there's a lot of content, I mean, that's the reason why I can't really answer whether, you know, where a taser could be deployed at. You're, you're kind of a big guy, you're bigger than me, probably. Um, so, but if I was even smaller, I might say, I'm asking you to do something, I try to grab you, and you, you, know, you pull away from me or whatever, the officer might end up deploying a, a taser on you. So, it, but it's never gonna be factual. I mean, it's never gonna be like, that's what they're gonna do, it, for sure. It only gives you, like, there's all sorts of factors that feed into that, if that makes sense. Um, like height, weight, mismatch, time of day, what type of call, uh, what type of struggling. So what what are you doing that, that isn't going uh, that isn't being compliant? Um, there's all sorts of. I mean, it, it, and as you can see, I mean, have you ever been in a fight ever in your life? That's good. But <laughs> but you know, I go, you look at boxers. They box for like you know, 10 rounds, and they're all trying to hit each other in the face or hitting each other in the body or whatever, and they're throwing probably 200, 300 punches, but really how many hit? Probably only like maybe not even 10% of that hit. So in a fight, it's the same thing. Never, everything is so dynamic. It, it, when, you're, when somebody's struggling, you don't know where that's going, how it's going, so use of force is kind of like that. You don't know when that, uh, uh, like a, uh, a baton might come out, a taser might come out, pepper spray, uh, hands, hitting, striking, kicking, you know, it's just, it all depends on what they call totality of the circumstances. So hopefully that helps. Okay. Thank you guys. No, thank you very much. Do you have any more questions, you're welcome to uh, ask the presenter after this session or today, like I said earlier, or you're welcome to email him or call him directly if you have more more questions. Uh, I know we're running a little behind on the.